Oh, g'day champions. I just had my uh, sushi for breakfast, so I think I'm ready to finally get back into doing some videos, eh? So we've got a Super Reverb here. As you can see, uh, probably not the greatest condition. <laughs> now, I gave an astronomical quote to this bloke for reasons that will become clear shortly, but uh, it needs a lot of work to get it to a point that I would consider it a world-class amp. Uh, so what we've decided to do given the budget, is just go over what we need to do in order to get the amplifier unit itself, the chassis, 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 uh, reliable and performing well. So there's lots of other cosmetic issues that we were going to address, and I did price up, um, like replacing the knobs, for example. You can see, like, there's not much left on that poor little bugger. <laughs> so it looks like it's been like dragged across its face there's even scratches there on the uh on the jewel looks like almost concrete you know like it's been dragged dragged across its face or sh thrown into utes on its face that kind of thing so that's probably what's caused the damage to the, the knobs there uh those those oh yeah look <laughs> that nuts just finger tight so that's that's not offering a good grounding to the to the uh chassis uh so yeah the the jacks are sort of beyond it i think we're going to be replacing them all their plating's worn off and they're just rusty as hell switches are still moving but i've got a feeling there's going to be a lot of intermittency in the controls alone but we'll, we'll get into the amp in a minute first i'll show you the cabinet so here's this sorry bugger um the speaker that's not installed was hanging on by one stud uh, it's got two studs in there, they're very loose, um, they're, they're like stripped in their holes, they're those type of screws that have that weird thread on the on the end, um, well they might just be machine screws actually, so yeah they're just countersunk machine screws. I offered to replace them all with studs that actually thread into the timber, uh, but he declined that. Um, this speaker was holding on by two studs, one of which had a nut. So it's holding on by one nut. <laughs> so it was just swinging around in there. Um, so we've got three Alnicos, which appear to be original. Sorry for my exposure there. It's, it's showing you the dark cabinet. So my hand looks ghost-like. Um, and it looks like it's had one replacement. All of these have continuity, but all of them are exhibiting cone cry, what we call cone cry. Uh, that's where there's actual noise when you move the cone and that manifests itself as distortion when there's signal coming through it. All the connections were pretty bad. Um, loose spade connectors. They've Someone in the past has attempted to solder these corroded spade connectors and of course the solder didn't have uh, any wetting there. It didn't want to stick to anything so that didn't, didn't happen. Uh, I offered to replace all of these speakers because we could look at recones, but at the moment recones are prohibitively expensive unless it's uh, the, the, unless the top priority is originality. Uh, it's not really economical to do so. So you could put these speakers aside, keep them in the boxes of the new speakers, and put in something like the ET10s from um, from WGS, which is what I quoted, but that got declined as well. So basically, we're doing nothing to the cabinet. Uh, we're just working on the amplifier. So, onto the cabinet. We've got this baffle, it's cracked. It, it is plywood, but it's lost its integrity. So it's very flexible. Uh, there's no cleat at the bottom, so it's kind of hard when I'm holding the camera, but it, the whole the whole thing's flexing, and it's mainly flexing around this, this crack here, so it's lost a lot of its integrity. The, baff, uh, the baffle cleats are split, and they're, they're pulling out of their screw mounts. The actual cabinet is split, and coming apart at its joins. So you can see the three individual pieces of timber there. And that's the case on both sides. So this is flexing as well. The dado joins up the top, or the, the finger joins are coming apart. Uh, and to access that and repair that, we'd have to remove the Tolex. Now I offered to do that and we'd have to remove that metal up there, which is the shielding. I offered to do that and reuse the Tolex if possible. So then it would maintain its look, but that got declined. So we'd, that probably would have been pretty much a full day in carefully stripping that Tolex, repairing the cabinet, redoing the joins, possibly even making a new baffle, because uh, that one's not really good, replacing all the studs. Um, but all of that got declined, so 
we're not working on any of that. I'm just going to return it as is. Basically, I, I might, I don't know, put another screw in there or something. I can't just have speakers flopping around. This looks like a uh, cheapo hi-fi cable, so probably not a proper reverb RCA cable. But, you know, if it works, it works. But more importantly, the, the reverb pan has failed as well. So there's not much that does work on this thing. So, you know, we're, we're kind of just working on the chassis. That's all we've been allowed to do. So I'll just show you quickly the front of this cabinet, which is another option I included, which got declined. So now just a quick look at the front. Uh, we actually got uh, asked for a quote to replace that. Um, now that, that grill cloth's about uh, 70 bucks a meter or something at the moment, depending where you get it from, uh, including shipping, of course. Uh, so that was out of, the budget so we're just going to return that as is the the casters are starting to lose their ball bearings are sort of underrated when you use casters like this you've got to think of the point load rating so if you're on uneven ground two of the casters aren't doing anything and the other two are taking all the load uh if it's on a tilt or if it gets dropped onto the casters that destroys them you can see how thin that metal is they're not really suited for this kind of weight of a, of a super reverb uh, so they're, they're probably on the way out as well. But anyway, we're, we're not doing anything with the cabinet, so we're just going to put that aside. I just thought I'd show you, and we'll get back onto the amplifier, and I'll go through that. So when I looked at the rear of the amp, when it turned up, the first thing I noticed was the same old JJ's problem. It's it's too common now to be called a, you know, and normally this is a manufacturing fault, simple as that. So stay away from JJ's entirely until they sort this out, because it's just ridiculous. Every week something's coming in with a fractured JJ's tube, so you can't tell me that it's it's a one-off. The other one's fine. No real even discoloration, so I don't think I don't think any valve failures were likely caused by the amplifier. It was just just a failure of that other one and then bring, being brought in for excessive hum because there's no common mode rejection with only one half of the output stage working. Now the rectifier valve looks okay. Uh, it's GZ34 though and According to all the documentation I can find, it's supposed to be a 5U4. Right, so I've got a feeling this used to be the AB568. You see down here, you've got some solid core wire going to the chassis. Um, I wonder if that used to be the cathode resistor leads, because uh, they had, what were they, 50 something ohm 7 watt resistors uh, from the cathodes to ground. It's a weird hybrid setup. Uh, and then they had uh, a cap going from cathode to cathode, a, a uh, one of the similar to this one down here, 10 mic or something cap, 5 mic, something like that. I can't remember. Because um, normally the, the Fender uh, amps would have a, a piece of like braid wire from the cathode to ground. So it makes me wonder if maybe that was the resistor lead and this one got. Uh, potentially blackface, but I, I need to go over the whole circuit and figure out what's been done because there's a lot of replaced components in here. So, just an overall look at the front up close. You can see the condition those knobs are in, as previously mentioned. We're losing a bit of the silk screen there. We've got some uh, corroded hardware there on the, on the jacks, so we'll probably replace them, those jacks. They've lost their plating internally anyway. So from that point forward, they, you clean them and they're okay for a while, but they just corrode again. The, the switch is caked with dust. So we'll have to see if we can clean that up. If not, we'll have to replace it. But again, this, this just keeps making the cost go up. When cost is an issue, um, there's only so much you can do. So you can only get an amp so good when the, when the budget's limited. I offered a price to replace all the knobs, uh, but any cosmetic repairs were seen as unnecessary. So we're not doing that. That one's, that one's just kind of comical <laughs> it's uh yeah it's a bit beyond it let's put it that way but you know some people like that real grungy look personally i'd probably replace them but that's it's a taste thing i guess we've we've got this uh corrosion which happens when the um the gloss coat on the outside is compromised and uh it allows moisture underneath the the lacquer and then that slowly, I forget the name for it, filiform or something, corrosion, happens to aluminium. You see it on motorcycle frames and stuff that are anodized, it finds its way under the anodization. And you can see there that the jewel's been scraped on the ground at some point too. So she's in pretty bad nick, but 
what we've been tasked to do is um, make it electronically and acoustically great, well, you know, audibly great, and leave a bit of the grunge. Uh, obviously, we've got to do some stuff where there's corrosion around electrical contacts, but stuff like that, possibly leakage from someone spilling a drink on the thing or something from, from back in the day, stuff like that could probably stay. It almost looks like it's been coated with, like, a... Uh, um, Penetrol or something because there's like this corrosion, but then it sort of it seems like it stopped in its in its uh, in its tracks and it sort of stayed where it was at some point. It's been coated with something, but I'll show you close up in a sec. So a quick overall look: uh, a lot of the plate load resistors have been replaced with carbon film at some point. Uh, the cathode resistors as well, uh, and the bypass caps. These blue caps generally last pretty long time, so do the brown ones. Um, someone's replaced the oscillator caps there for the tram they look like either generic or ic brand film caps have a closer look in a sec there's some of the carbon comps still remaining even including some plate loads there so we'll check them for drift we'll check everything for drift uh, and it looks like there's been some modifications in this area to the phase inverter as well you can see the um the one megs there and the 470 so that's probably been changed from the ab568 values to the uh or no, possibly not, because that was already 470 and 1 meg, I think. I'll have to do some research, look at the different models and see maybe what the motive behind that change was, because uh, at some point there were other values there. Maybe that was AA270. I don't know. I'm only getting my head around the different models and their changes recently, because the old stuff doesn't come in every single day, uh, and I sort of need to brush up on the history to know, because they're almost never original. Uh, <laughs> They've almost always been, been modded in some way or, or, you know, had significant work done to them. So it's kind of hard to, to sort of go back in time and figure out what it used to be and, and what it wants to be. But essentially, I think the customer was pretty happy with the tone of this thing. Uh, it's just that it had several faults. So it's got the dreaded wax, very thick coating there. Looks like maybe someone's tried to... Um, remove it with with hot air or something where there's been rework it's a little bit thinner like they've cleaned it off a bit but then you've got critical areas where you've got ht right next to uh other lines and nothing's been done so um for example right there that's got your uh the output stage grids tied pretty closely to the pi coupling caps uh, sorry pi plate loads so areas like that are big potential for leakage and there's some of that over near the uh near the tone stack components as well but we'll go through we'll check it uh, for board leakage and we'll see if we can just clean individual areas instead of going crazy like we did with that twin recently because that was like <sighs> multiple days straight away i'm noticing you know pretty common areas of issues with these things like this resistor just moving around in its, uh, in, its, in its little hole there. So that's intermittent connection at best. You can see there the movement in that solder joint. That's not fantastic. And that's because this area of the board flexes up over time. It's only screwed in certain areas and it's got all this area here that's not fixed and then there's another screw there. So that, that's buckled up over the years and stressed a few joints that weren't stressed when they were first manufactured. So we've got telltale wires floating around in midair, too long. So that, that output transformer has been replaced. We'll flip it over and have a look shortly. It's just very, very messy stuff everywhere. Um, just everything's been run to wherever. You've got, uh, oh, that's nice. <laughs> so this is a good example of why you don't fix to uh, transformer mounting hardware. So that's your, uh, your main safety earth coming in from the, the power cord. <laughs> it's just finger tight, so yeah, don't do it. Um, there's no bond there. I mean, you can see it's, it hasn't stuck to the chassis, so why do it? And you can see down here, this one's much the same and that's your HT center tap. <laughs> so yeah, that would be worthless. So that would have had 
This would, this thing, like most of these amps, it would have had so many issues that they all would have just blended into one. And that is, it sounds like shit. <laughs> you can see there, even the uh, heater balance one there, bolts loose, the whole transformer's moving. So all of that's got to be cleaned up and addressed and reconnected. Gonna rework the bias supply uh, and replace that cap, obviously. I'm gonna do what I do to every valve rectified amp these days and uh, put some backup diodes in line with the, the plates, just in case this rectified valve ever fails, it won't deliver AC to the rest of the amp. Someone's replaced the uh, screen grid resistors and grid stopper, but you've just got the wires just passing straight through, so luckily there's enough length on them that I can I can remove that solder, twist them around and re-solder it so it's an actual nice joint instead of just sort of passing through because that will crack over time as well. The same goes for the other socket. I'll probably just clean it up and uh, reuse those components. There's some melted wires there, but that's par for the course on, on uh, amps everyone's had a go at. Seems like no one can stop themselves from melting the jacket. <laughs> just looking at the, the colour of the heater wire, it looks like someone's replaced that at some point. Maybe they melted it working on this stuff or who knows. I, don't, I think those sockets are original so I don't think they replace the sockets. They've used the um, ground switch there to to just be a termination point for the mains coming in. Uh, it's not the end of the world but probably disconnect it completely and run a new cable all the way over to the fuse and the switch just to clean this area up a bit. Looking over here it looks like the uh, Reverb transformer's been replaced as well. A little bit of melted wire. More tack solder joints. But you know, we'll suss that out and see if the transformer's a suitable replacement. So looking at the front end here, looks like the jacks have still got some um, flex on those contacts, so that they might be working okay, but they're pretty corroded, so I kind of want to replace them. So uh, I've quoted for that and got approval on that, so I think that's something we'll definitely do. Uh, a lot of the pot wiring looks original. Uh, we'll check all of them. Once we, once we do the, the main work, we'll, we'll check the, uh, you know, the functionality of all the other components and check that the pots are recoverable. Okay, so we'll rework the bias supply, replace this cap obviously, and uh, that diode check that well i'll just replace the resistor the the bias supply is not somewhere where you want to maintain vintage value half this amp's already been replaced anyway but you don't want to stuff around here you want to do the job properly so we we will do that well that's good the bias resistor just pulled straight out of its eyelet so this this amp's riddled with dry solder joints all through everywhere you look is those little cracks around the legs there. So uh, pretty much every solder joint I probably want to go over and check out. So looking at the reverb and uh, vibrato pedal sockets, they'll probably clean up okay. The nuts are rusty, <laughs> just like me, born a redhead. Uh, but yeah, it looks like the barrels aren't too corroded. They've still got their plating, so they'll probably clean up all right. We might be able to reuse them. The output jacks again, because uh, they don't get used as much as the input jack, they're, um, they're not as worn. Being that it's a combo, they tend to be, be just plugged in and forgotten about, but we'll check that they're, they're reliable as well. There is a little bit of uh, green discoloration on that one there, a bit of corrosion. So that's probably not shorting when nothing's plugged in like it should. So we might, we might just, since it's a speaker area, we might just replace them anyway. Um, yeah, generally you're only plugged into that one. So if that is clean in that area and it's making contact with the barrel, you're probably okay. Uh, but if it ever gets unplugged and plugged into the extension cabinet, um, you could have no continuity there at all. So that could lead to a flyback event, which bring, brings me back to the output stage. I will put some flyback diodes there as well, just in case uh, that ever occurs. Now this unit being an international, it's got your voltage switches here, so we'll, we'll see uh, how that goes. Often those wafers on the back flex and they uh, they start to become intermittent. Feels like there's a bit of backlash there, but 
I might give him the option to hardwire that to 240 volts because he's not traveling with it. So just another peace of mind thing. If anyone ever comes back here and switches it, won't do anything. And check the fuse. It's supposed to be a 1.5 amp for international. That's a two amp, so that's not good. Um, probably wouldn't blow in a significant fault mode. So I'll change that with a one amp because this 1.5 is sort of a, a fudge figure. Um, that suits all voltages, sort of, kinda, but two amps a bit excessive. The original one had two amps, and that was to suit Australian mains, uh, sorry, American mains. On 240, I think, uh, I think um, one amp's adequate. I'll double check that, see what it draws, and see what the schematics say. But this is the original transformer by the looks of it, uh, but it says. 117 volts, 60 cycles there for some reason. It's like they just used whatever plates they had, even though it was the international model with the multiple voltages. So look at the top. This transformer's been replaced, but it looks like it's not like a, a new model. It might've been pulled out of another amp, but it doesn't have the cloth wire like the original had. I'll have to look up that code and see what it is. These have been replaced with these big hollow things. Almost seem like valves there, don't they? <laughs> and all the droppers have been replaced. That's a reasonably good job. Um, if there's no problems with the uh, filtering on these on these nodes, we'll leave them in. They've replaced the the, the drop uh, the the balance resistors. I can see some metal films down in there too. So this is uh, pretty decent work. It looks like they uh, they've cleaned the board a little bit, which is good. There's still a bit of flux and stuff there, but it doesn't have that big big th thick wax coating on it that absorbs all the dirt that touches it. Now one of the issues I've got with these is. Partially they're ridiculously large, like that's a 20 microfarad 500 volt, right? And it's only 65 degree rated, that's shit. In this case they'll live plenty fine because it's in a separate cam, but if you use them in the chassis right next to, you know, an output stage or whatever, 65's nothing, it's not even a cup of tea, right? So <laughs> that's, uh, it doesn't say how many hours at that, but I have to look up the data sheet if they have one. Uh, let me show you the caps I use. So these are my current favourites in uh, 22 microfarad, uh, 500 volt. So, you know, equivalent, 22, whatever, it's an electro cap, the tolerance is plenty. But they're 105 degree rated, and they're like probably less than half the size in terms of volume. And there's the 100 microfarad, 350, same rating as that, but 105 degree rated. I think part of the reason these have such a low temperature rating is because they're essentially a hollow can that's got a smaller cap inside it. They're made this big for cosmetics to suit, uh, you know, vintage restorations where you expect to see the same size cap. And uh, in this day and age, these caps are filled by capacitor <laughs> all the way to the outside of the can, right? It's just the size that, that the can is. If you open one of these up, there's probably something about that size inside this can. And that creates an air pocket in there, which probably means, you know, it, it's like a little oven. Um, caps don't normally get hot during operation. They do a little bit, but you know, you're talking um, a couple of degrees different, but I'm just wondering if, if the different temp rating is because they can't dissipate heat. Um, I, I don't know. So if there's no problem with uh, filtering on any of these nodes, I'm, ju I'm just gonna leave these in place. And there's a quick look at the transformers. I have to check their codes and see uh, what the deal is there. I think the output's a replacement. The power and the uh, power transformer and the choke. Maybe original, however. You can see the condition of the chassis there. There's just rust everywhere. The plating's starting to suffer quite a bit. Uh, but yeah, we'll just check that it's got proper connections wherever the grounds are. There's not a lot we can really do about that. Could give it some penetrol to sort of stop it in its tracks. So I know I sort of have started saying this quite a bit now, but I might leave this one here and I'll just show you the finished product once the work's done, because I don't have time to uh, run you through a step-by-step, -step, but we'll um, have a look at it later and uh, have a listen and see how she goes. Obviously not through that cab, but through, uh, through another cab here and see if there's any quirks that need ironing out and go from there. So until then, legends, take it squeezy.